So I already talked about the first episode of Ben 10, broke it down scene by scene, and determined whether or not it started well. Since you guys seem to enjoy it, let's talk about episode 2, Washington, B.C. The episode begins with a mother and her son caught in a house fire. As the flames burn on around them, Ben as he blasts is fighting fire with fire as he learned in the last episode. He uses a power that absorbs all the flames in the area, taking them out. This is a new power surprising him as well as us, noticeable by the look on his face. This represents the fact that his powers are still a mystery, even for him, and something we have to look forward to exploring as the series progresses. It also shows that he learns from his past experiences as seen with using heat blast against a blaze yet again. He melts through the bricks surrounding a window, taking the entire window out and opening a gap in order to take the family through. By not using the window itself, he avoids the glass that he would encounter while breaking through, which would have been a smart move if it didn't send the debris crashing to the ground below where in a people could have been. We don't get to see where it crashed down, the outcome of that decision, but given the crowd that we see is formed outside, it was definitely a big risk. During some ego boosting outside, he sees a kid with a card saying that it is a Gold Sumer Slammer card. Sitting on the ground next to the boy, still in his alien form, he questions the boy on where he got it, learning that it was inside a box of sumo cereal. The fact that Ben gave up the chance to get praise remained in his form as he sat on the ground and gave the boy with the card his undivided attention just shows how much getting one of those cards means to him. We hear a horn beeping as Gwen and Max arrive on the scene, telling Ben that the fire was just a diversion, covering up a jewelry store heist as the robbers get away. Ben takes one more look at the card, the one he really wants to have, and they go on their way. After the banger of a theme song, we see the robbers zooming through the streets as the RV is following close behind. Ben as he blasts is burning a hole in the seat, causing Grandpa Max to comment that he should have bought asbestos seat covers, another line that shows Grandpa Max's knowledge on fire that was represented in the last episode, since asbestos are fire resisted up to 1600 degrees Fahrenheit, give or take. Ben apologizes, saying he can't help it, an excuse that Gwen immediately shuts down by saying he had 10 to choose from and chose the only one with a flaming butt. It can be argued that he was heat blast before he was in a vehicle, but I'm not sure what stops him from changing back to Ben for the time being. Ben says, Jealous. A double entendre that I just had to point out. Ben hits the vehicle with a fireball, knocking it off course and crashing it into a wall. Another dangerous strategy that could have gone all kinds of wrong, but thankfully nobody was hurt in the collision. The second action this episode that didn't take the well-being of bystanders into consideration. Ben removes the thieves from their vehicle and tells them that they picked the wrong day to be bad guys, transforming back into Ben before he can finish his sentence, giving his powerlessness away. The goons decide to get the trolls and try to make an escape now that they know they're only dealing with a kid, showing a new issue in regards to Ben's watch. It only stays active for a limited amount of time before needing a cooldown period, setting up new stakes due to the time limit, and possibly establishing new strategies that Ben will need to employ in order to circumvent the issue. Ben trying to get out of the situation says he'll let them walk off with a warning, walking away as the cops show up. Proud of himself for handling the situation, he says, They're all yours, officers! As if he's handing off his job, well done, further emphasized by him saying, Now I know y'all wanna thank me, but... But the popo doesn't take him seriously, shutting him down and saying that it isn't playtime. When comparing these cops to the park ranger from last episode, it's pretty much night and day. I mean, they never even tried to figure out what a kid was doing at a crash site to begin with, showcasing why the city needs herpes. <laughs> That's what I wrote! showing why the city needs heroes like Ben whenever the police are like them. Ben says it isn't fair that he's the one that caught those guys, showing a less mature and more self-centered attitude that will probably be touched on as he grows as the show goes on. Next scene, we see a guy knocking on a door outside of the office of, according to the sign, Dr. Animo. He walks in and we get glimpses of all sorts of animals, before Dr. Animo, get it? Animo, animal, comes up behind and surprises the man, by yelling about how he even got in. To answer that question, we find out that the man is his landlord, but that Animo's rent is six months past due, so he may not remain a tenant for long. Animo says that all his funds go into his research, like that somehow makes everything better, and relieves him of his financial responsibility before trying to kick the landlord out, saying that he's disturbing his work. Lord of the Land doesn't take that laying down and says, <laughs> Looks like you were disturbed long before I got here, pal. He tells Animo that if he doesn't pony up the cash, him and his animals will be out onto the street, leading to some wordplay from Animo, foreshadowing the man's fate. Pony up. 
Interesting choice of phrases. You must be an animal lover. Then you're gonna love this. Animal puts on a helmet that gets him roasted again by the landlord. <laughs> What's that? Do you remember the moose lodge or something? Animal then says it's called a transmodulator as he uses it to turn the frog into a giant and get the last laugh once it gets a mouthful of the landlord saying, Can't hear you. Sounds like you have a frog in your throat. <laughs> or is that the other way around? Spitting him out before declaring that he's a step away from getting what is rightfully his, setting up the question of what has caused his anger and the mystery surrounding what got him to this point. It also showcases his power, leaving the extent of it up to imagination but showing enough to get us to question the possibilities ourselves. He says he only needs a few more components before an advertisement pops on right on time, directing him where he needs to go to get what the doctor ordered. The same mart that he is headed to, Ben and the gang are already at. Grandpa and Gwen are shopping normally with Grandpa looking for unusual things to eat, which Gwen isn't too pleased about. Asking if they can have a normal dinner for once, which G-Max shrugs off like it was never even said with any seriousness. While they were talking, Ben was over in the cereal aisle, finding a box that could contain a Gold Sumer Slammer card inside. Keeping with his want of that card, the same card he gave up earlier, foreshadowing him having to give it up yet again once Animal arrives, as we all know he will. Seeing a flash come from an aisle away, Gwen goes back to check on Ben, seeing the entire aisle is completely destroyed. Another example of Ben not caring about collateral damage in his pursuit to get and do what he believes he can and should. He wants the Sumo Slammer card, so given that he saves the world with his powers, it's not a stretch for him to believe he can use them for his own gain as well, which is what we see here. Gwen finds Ben inside of a cereal box, still not finding the card, but finding his way into a lecture instead. Gwen tells him that he should use his powers for good, not for his own self gain, which Although true from an outsider's perspective, it's also true that she doesn't have the powers herself. She doesn't understand how he feels, but given how often she wants to help Ben save the day, how she keeps him in line is possibly foreshadowing her having some semblance of power in the future and the possibility of her perspective changing because of it. She's the more responsible one, yes, as was shown in my last video, but at the end of the day, Ben arguably has the greatest responsibility and shows maturity whenever he makes sacrifices for it, as he did when abandoning the card earlier. A store employee sees Gwen in the aisle and blames her for the mess, with her saying that it was Ben and him not believing her. He tells her that someone is going to have to pay for all of it, implying it to be her and causing this hilarious face of disappointment, showcasing more consequences that are inflicted onto others yet again by Ben acting without considering those around him. With great comedic timing, we now see Grandpa Max buying every box Ben vandalized in search for his card, more collateral damage that Ben doesn't and take seriously. Instead, he blames Gwen catching him over them being blamed for the mess, instead of taking responsibility for the mess and that what he did was wrong. Leading to Uncle Ben saying that although he can appreciate how much that card means to Ben, Ben himself has become obsessed with obtaining it. Ben responds to this sarcastically, implying that since he saved people from a burning building, that that heroic action means that he deserves the card. This is a departure from his character last video, where he wanted to help people beyond all else and it felt like he deserved the powers because of it. This episode, however, he feels like he is owed something for doing good, seeing it more of a job than a responsibility, which given that we are unaware of what happened in between this episode and the last, helps that idea in that regard. Once he started doing more mundane things than fighting killer robots, like he did in the first episode, then it's only natural that he would get bored of it. I just wish we at least got a mention of any possible off-screen feats. For example, if he said, it's not like I didn't just stop my 12th crime this week, it would have given insight into his feelings and complimented the criminal acts in the beginning of the episode. It's a minor nitpick but would have served to make this shift in character feel more natural, more earned, instead of the quick shift we were left with instead. Gwen says that Ben guilting them was a low move, but that doesn't seem to sway him a bit, saying he'll do whatever it takes to get what he wants. No defense for this one, jerk response Ben. Ben then sees a display case with sumo slammer cards inside, drawing his attention away and disappointing his family as they walk away without him, heading to the pet department, which gets another pretty good joke from Gwen. Please tell me you 
not looking for our breakfast. Ben is fantasizing about the goat slammer card as the ground begins to shake and the store starts to fall apart. Animo is riding the giant frog we saw earlier, here to steal his components since he established earlier that he has no remaining funds. Ben tries to stop him, but since he wasted his use in the cereal aisle, his watch is currently still recharging. Animo leaves him alone, showing that the man has morals, given this is the second person that he's left alive, this time not engaging in any conflict since he doesn't have to, making him more sympathetic than the robot that was willing to kill indiscriminately last episode. Once two security guards approach, Animo leaves him be as well, as he heads to the pet section where he runs into Max and Gwen. He fires his growth beam their direction, and when they dodge it, the animal behind them wasn't so lucky. Due to the fact that he's limited his usage to animals thus far, it's safe to say he had no intention of ever hitting them, and knew they'd jump out of the way. Further emphasized by what he says after he hits a bird with the beam as well. Arise to your full potential, my pets! Ben races to where his family is, running into Animo and his animals before saying, Man, what kind of pet food are they selling around here? Highlighting the humor in a way that's clever as well as funny. Dr. Animo hypes himself up, saying nobody will stop him from getting what he deserves, that it's his time to make history, making us wonder what it was that he felt he was earned that he never got. Did he actually deserve it and is his anger justified? If so, what about his current actions, leaving room for future development and giving us something to ponder? Gwen agrees with what I said earlier, saying, If he didn't go serial diving, one of those heroes could be saving us from becoming hamster chow. Establishing stakes from having been seemingly unarmed, complimenting the idea idea that actions have consequences, and power has responsibility, as Uncle Ben would say. We've seen this this episode as well as the last, and tying it together by humbling Ben in the next scene as Hamantasaur attacks the trio, knocking him down and cornering the others. The fear in Ben's face spoke volumes and hopefully humbled him down in response to his ego-driven low blow from earlier. Ben gets the hamster's attention, hops on a scooter, and leads it away from his family, using expert maneuverability on a scooter that he has never showcased prior to this moment, he dodges the beast's attacks, pinning it under a aisle of shells. This shows him going hero without his powers, something he tried to do in the first episode, this time with a different outcome. He still has his heart in the right place, even if his brain isn't, making up for his snarky comment from earlier by showing who he is when it's all said and done. His skill in the scooter can be seen as the riders needing to give him a way out, so they cheaply decided to make one, but given it's only the second episode, I'll give them the benefit of the doubt, with my opinion being dependent on if this skill is utilized in the coming future. If it is, then I can simply just hit canon it as something he learned before the events of the show. He's a kid, it's possible. If it never is, then it was a cheap way to write your main character out of a corner, and I'd have wrote it differently myself. Ben getting him to smash himself off the bottom two aisles so they both fall inward, Ben getting him trapped within a smaller place, like to head through the door leading into the bathroom, getting the tusks stuck within something where he couldn't necessarily pull them out, throwing items till they hit the creature's eyes and it knocks itself out when slamming full speed into a wall, the list goes on. Those were quickly made up on the fly, but you get the idea. Strategies that don't require certain levels of skill to actually complete them. Ben is excited that he won, saying not even giant hamsters could beat him, getting mixed reactions from his family. Max gives a slight smile, glad Ben is okay at the end of the day, but still not necessarily happy with how things played out. Gwen seems still pretty ticked off, which given what Ben said earlier and how his actions almost cost them their their lives, as the seemingly more responsible of the two, it's hard to blame her. Dr. Animo gives more villain monologue, not much of substance, but ending it with, I will turn Washington DC into Washington BC. He said the thing, he said the thing. After he flies off and the giant frog escapes behind him, the worker from earlier comes over and asks Ben if he could reward him with anything he wants. Ben thinks about the super slammer card, but before he can say that, he's snatched away by grandpa, telling him they don't have time for that and that that they have a parrot to follow. Although Ben could say that he wants that card and will be back for it, given that the team are on a seemingly never-ending road trip, it is canonically possible that they never actually return to that store, nor have time to. So I'll give them this one. Ben didn't argue, he chose to go along with his family, and yet again put his own wants behind him, even if there was some initial hesitation, which makes sense for his character thus far. In the RV, our three musketeers follow the bird brain doctor, as Ben looks frustrated since this is his third time missing out on what he wants due to what is important, his responsibility as a hero. As they are on the chase, Max says it's just like the good old days, causing Gwen to rightfully ask what kind of plumber he was, leading to, Oh yeah, darn good one. 
a nod at the suspicious past we had glimpses of last episode, keeping the mystery of who he truly is alive by adding a new layer. Chasing danger animals or something close to that in some regard had to have been a part of it. Ben says that he saved the Mart from the giant hamster and got nothing in return, yet again commenting how unfair it is. This falls in line with his more self-centered side, his want for admiration and acknowledgement which G-Max shuts down by saying, Being a hero isn't about others knowing you did something good, it's about you knowing you did something good. Being a hero is its own reward. They then slide a joke in there to try and keep things more lighthearted for the kids in the audience with Ben asking if he was reading cards at the Mart and G-Max saying yes in the most serious way possible. It's the serious demeanor and the stone cold delivery that got a smile out of me so I wanted to point it out. After some research on Online, Gwen finds out Dr. Animo's backstory, that five years ago he was a promising researcher in veterinarian science, but it was unearthed that he was doing inhumane experiments on the animals instead. When he didn't win a certain award after all his hard work, he flipped out and that's what got him to where he is today. Gwen then asks Ben if that sounds familiar to him, the idea of feeling the need to be rewarded for your work in an external way, involving the acknowledgement of others. Given Ben's silent response instead of his normal remarks, it proves that he took her words into consideration, as he resets by looking out the window with his hand on his chin yet again, the same position as when he was disappointed about the card earlier, as well as when Grandpa was giving him a lecture. Good consistency here, I like it. Grandpa Max looks out the window as Animo gets away, saying he could be anywhere by now, with Gwen bringing up whenever Animo said the name of the episode, giving Ben an idea on where he may have went, the National History Museum. All three members put their skills to the test in the scene, Grandpa chasing the bird in a high speed chase while acting as a mentor to Ben, Gwen using technological smarts to unearth Animo's past, and Ben using his situational intelligence, like when he shot the lasers back at the bot last video, he put two and two together on the fly once the hint was said. He may not be able to deduce them from his mind alone, but once he gets something that gives him a hint, the idea flourishes from there. Good way to get use out of every character with nobody quite feeling like they outshine the rest to a distracting degree. They find a gaping hoe in the museum's wall with a feather left behind behind, proving that it's the right place. G-Max and Gwen both compliment Ben on the idea, with Grandpa's being more encouraging and Gwen's being more underhanded with an insult, to which Ben has a retort for this time, contrasting against how he acted last time and proving my point about his silence being an answer all on its own. Ben walks in and finds a box with electronics from the Mart, the item that Animo must have needed to finish his invention, another good nod to establish continuity and I love it. The transition here where they lower the box to reveal Animo is genius as well. Reveal box, establish tension as the box takes up all visibility, reveal Animo. Gotta give them props where it's deserved. Animo realizes they are there, as well as who they are, without even having to turn around. Given his dialogue with them at the Mart, as well as him breaking away from them as they followed him, it makes sense that he'd have a good idea of who they are. But how he knew they were there is a different story. Does his helmet give him heightened senses? Is he actually an alien and it is related to his species? Did he do experiments on himself as well? or is it just the intuition you have whenever you can feel other people's eyes on you? It opens the door for fan theories while also making sense without it, even if feeling a little cheap if never explored. Ben tells him that they know of his plan, and that his plan is over, but Animo retorts that it's only just begun. He says the parts he needed was to awaken dormant cells, and although Ben says he needs subtitles, the fact that we're in a museum surrounded by extinct animal bones says all that it needs to, foreshadowing the fact that at least one will be transformed back into a living being, which Animo not only says but proves right after whenever he brings a mammoth back to life. My biggest gripe here is given that there's fur on the mammoth, it's unlikely that it actually has any real dormant cells, and that instead it would be entirely fake. There are mummified mammoth exhibits however, so I could be wrong, just wanted to point out the possibility regardless. Not giving it a demerit since I don't know for sure though, so if someone in the comments have more knowledge on museum exhibits and want to chime in, I'd love to hear about how these things actually work. Anyway, back to the show. G-Max and Gwen go after Animo as Ben transforms into forearms and takes on a mammoth. Gwen takes a spear from the exhibit and uses it to fight off the giant bird, stating that she has skills too. But just like with the scooter scene from earlier, this side of Gwen wasn't previously established, so now that it is, I hope we see more of it in the future. Animo uses his helmet on the skeleton of a Tyrannosaurus Rex, bringing it back to life and somehow giving it more skin, turning it into a zombie with a pretty solid design. This is a big logical leap, which makes me wonder why they gave it skin at all, but it does establish that the helmet has that capability now. The helmet not having set limitations is a problem for me, making it seem more like a plot 
squad pusher, but whether or not that's a problem would depend on how this episode ends. Ben is getting thrown around by the mammoth, slammed into exhibits and losing pretty badly till he grabs its tail, spins around and yeets it into a wall, finally taking it out. This wasn't a great fight or anything, but it got the job done. Ben used its weight distribution against it as he spun it around, causing the throw to pack a harder punch whenever it finally landed. Plus, him throwing up out of nausea at the end was a nice touch. His aliens, or at least forearms, isn't necessarily immune to human conditions, for lack of a better term, which is nice to have established. Animal says he's going to reclaim what's rightfully his, most likely the prize that was brought up earlier that he felt like he deserved. As he leaves, the bird comes back in time to snatch Gwen, and although Forearms tries to hang on, the watch makes its timeout sound and he falls hitting the ground below and turning back into Ben as the bird flies off into the darkness as Ben screams. <laughs> The desperation in his voice showing yet again that regardless of their bickering, he cares for his cousin when it's all said and done. Also, J Max picked up a piece of paper that will probably become important later, but I didn't know how to fit it into the script, so we're moving on. Grandpa Max pulls up and asks if Ben called for a taxi, and then they are yet again in a high-speed chase. Is this the third one this episode? <laughs> Crazy. As she's being carried off, Gwen mocks what was said by who we can assume to be one of her parents. Ben Grandpa, honey, it'll be an adventure. Which was a sentiment she echoed last episode as well. How this vacation with Grandpa thing wasn't her idea, and making it easier to relate to her in a situation that at face value wouldn't necessarily be relatable. Animo and Rex are rampaging through the city, and somehow get a super slammer card caught on Rexy's toe. Can I call it a toe? Toenail? Whatever. Most likely setting up Ben completely acknowledging his responsibility as a hero all on his own and making the choice without any outside help to choose to be a hero over getting the card that he's wanted all episode. Gwen makes a phone call as G-Max shows Ben the paper he picked up earlier. I knew it would be important and it shows that Animo is after his award. Er, no duh. Since this is a kid show, I'll let this over explanation go, but I feel like it was a bit wasted given all the hints we've had to his motive up to this point. It goes with the plot, but doesn't feel necessary. The phone rings and it's Gwen, but since we used time up with the last scene, she tells the duo where she is off screen. They arrive as she drops her phone, shattering it on the ground below. Establishing the stakes of the scene, hammered home when G-Max says that she will be next. Ben transforms into a bug guy who has yet to be named, and Gwen loses grip, caught as she falls to the ground below. Here we learn the bug's name is Stinkfly, as they get attacked by the bird yet again. This is a pretty good dogfight. I like the choreography, especially when it continues in this far out shot as G-Max tries to find a way to get Gwen so Stinkfly can go all out. He climbs a tower and Stinkfly hands her off to him, using the two as a diversion to take down the bird from behind before heading back to Animo. No new power was demonstrated here so not much to comment on in regards to the fight. It was okay, set a good precedent for aerial battles within the show, but again, nothing great. The homie who actually won the award is showing it off to a couple guys in what feels like the middle of the night for some reason as Animo busts in and exclaims that the man has something that belongs to him before taking the trophy for himself, which was built up and then outright said throughout the episode. Why there were people admiring it at this hour when it's dark outside is not something I can find any justification for. It's a coincidence that feels super out of nowhere just so Animo and the guy that won can be on screen at the same time. Pretty goofy, but hey, it doesn't hurt anything right now and it is feasible as a possibility, so let's move on. Stinkfly comes in and starts to fight. Seeing that sumo slammer card but having to abandon it, let it be crushed in order to save the man from getting a Byrexy. Now that we see why we needed the man on screen, it does help in justifying the low probability of him actually being there. Animo fires a laser from his helmet, whether it's the same one that evolves creatures as well as brings them to life is unknown. But if it isn't, then that's another new capability of this plot pusher. And if it is, then it's pretty goofy that he'd risk making his adversary even more powerful, not great outcomes either way. For the sake of retaining Animo's established intelligence, however, we'll say it's a hurt people laser, but he should have fought only with the reanimated T-Rex in this scene, so I wouldn't have to justify the abilities of his helmet myself, as well as showcasing the power of the T-Rex that he rode in on. Stinkfly shoots nasty liquid, that's disgusting, but a new power to take note of nonetheless. The liquid incapacitates
incapacitates Rexy, leaving Animo open, which he isn't since it's established that he can shoot lasers or something from his helmet, another example of why that was a bad decision and that every frame of writing and animation is important to your story's consistency. But since in episode he is left open at this moment, Stinkfly knocks the trophy from his hand, shattering it off the ground below before taking the helmet off of Animo and reversing all the effects that it had, turning Rexy into bones and the big bird back to its small self, saving Gwen and Max in the process. But like, what were they doing outside in front of it anyway? They were in the safety of a building last seen before, which leaving does go against their intelligent characterization just for the line of, Don't even try to accept me now. I'll give it a pass since they didn't get themselves into any real trouble being face to face with the bird, but hopefully this isn't a trend for future episodes. The episode ends with Animo being arrested, saying that he deserved the award yet again, with Ben himself saying that it sounds familiar, showing his growth throughout the episode, his ability to acknowledge his own thoughts, proving that he learned from it, which is further shown in the last scene when he says that beating Animo and saving the city was its own reward, and that he's thankful to have Animo's helmet as a memory of what happened that day, with Gwen saying that he saved her too, and saying thank you in a really sweet scene that Ben ruins in line with his character by calling her a dweeb before things got too sappy. This was a good episode, not as good as the last, but solid nonetheless. We got introduced to new aliens like Forearms and Stinkfly, with them both being used in different scenarios, showing more ways that Ben's watch can tackle different situations. We also got a new power for Heat Blast, where he can now absorb heat, or flames at least, which is also probably going to be pretty useful in the future. We got a new enemy who we may see again in Dr. Animo, a genius scientist with questionable morals that feels like he wasn't recognized for the scientific advancements that, whether ethical or not, he was able to achieve. His perspective was used as an extreme contrast for Ben's need for affirmation and acknowledgement, showing Ben how he could turn out, and with the help from Grandpa and Gwen, how he could stray away from that, which was the lesson this episode that he understood by the end. The lesson all heroes need to know that you don't help others for their approval or for some type of reward, but because it's the right thing to do and you have the power to do it. Animo's helmet being retired at the end of the episode was the best case scenario. Now the limitations not being set doesn't really matter, since it won't be a returning plot element anytime soon, so it can't be used as a cheap plot pusher nor something that we have to be afraid of popping back up and affecting the plot next episode for example. It was the best decision possible and I'm glad they went with it, especially since whenever they find out ways to set limitations for it, they can always bring it back. It also symbolizes Ben's growth this episode, a reminder of who he could be if he didn't develop in the way that he did. Just like with the helmet, this chapter in Ben's development was closed, or that's the hope anyway. Mistakes can be made, he is still a child and he could backpedal in the future, but I guess we'll see. The action was decent, but nothing great. There wasn't any good tactical decision making or strategies used. There were some decent ones, but nothing really new, with the biggest thing we got out of it being the new aliens, capabilities of those aliens, and what that may mean for future conflict. Besides the scene where they left the safety of cover for no apparent reason, we got some good character moments from all three of our main heroes, where they all had a chance to showcase their skills like Gwen's technological side as well as talent with a spear, Ben's problem solving as well as scooter skills, and a new hint in regards to Grandpa Max's past that hopefully we touch on more as the show goes on. Did I miss anything or did you interpret something? far differently than I did, let me know in the comments below. Dislike if you disliked it and for more news, reviews, and whatever we choose, stay tuned to Nerdsfeed. Have a great day, thank you.